All right, so this recording is for CISP 440. Even though there's a good chance that I might be able to make it back to um, <clears throat> the class later today, um, since we already talked about canceling today's, well, uh, we're not meeting in person, okay? So you guys might have made plans already. And that's why I'm also delivering today's lecture by recording. So we are currently done with propositional logic. Okay, so this is the last homework assignment is due today. <coughs> so I am going to talk about the solution of this homework assignment on Monday. So that way, you know, we I don't have to, you know, I can pre-record everything for today's lecture and give it to you uh, even before the due date of the homework assignment. So the homework assignment uh, basically concludes you know, the entire uh, section for propositional logic. We have already started on discrete probability. We went through the entire module talking about counting. <coughs> and we are now on to discrete probability. So that's our current topic right now is discrete probability. All right. And we talked about the outcome and events already in the previous lecture. We talked about the birthday problem. We also talked about the coin toss problem a little bit, not in detail from last time, but we talked about this you know, in um, when we first mentioned you know the whole concept of trials versus outcomes and stuff like that. So we'll start with uh, section four today. And if you're concerned about the exam one, um, I will get it done, you know, grading, you know, before Monday. So by Monday, you know, you would have your grade on Canvas already. <coughs> All right, so getting started with uh, section four. So uh, coin tosses is interesting because, you know, if I toss a coin five times, what are the chances that there will be three heads and two tails? So in this particular question, I don't really care about the ordering of where the three heads and the two tails are. So that means I can have your know, head, 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 tail, tail. I can have tail, tail, head, head, head. Or I can have head, tail, head, tail, head, and so on. So uh, I'm only concerned about, I just want to add up to three heads and two tails after tossing a coin five times. <coughs> and we'll initially assume the coin is not even loaded. So that means you know, there's a half chance or 0.5 of a chance that I can land on the head and also 0.5 of a chance to land on the tail. The experiment in this example is a sequence of five trials because every single time I toss the coin, it is one single trial. Omega is essentially all the ways that we can end up with the five co coin tosses because the result of each trial is independent from all of the other trials, then the cardinality of the of omega is two to the power of five. All right, so this is when um, having my tablet connected can be helpful, and it is currently not connected. So let me get that hooked up first, because I want to show you, you know, graphically how are we representing, you know, these. Um, outcomes because I think it's always helpful to show you guys you know graphically how something is represented when it's you know something when a graph is the appropriate or in this case a tree is the appropriate representation of what is happening <coughs> all right so give me one more second I'm still making Connections between all the devices. And let's see. All right. Okay. And then I have to run my command here to get the tablet to reflect on the screen. So it's screen copy dot message.
And yes, I'm also checking on the recorder to make sure that uh, everything is being recorded. There we go. Okay. All right. So what we are talking about is five coin tosses, right? So initially, you know, we are here. So after one single coin toss, we have you know, two outcome. We can have a head or a tail. The second toss is going to end up with this, right? So we have head, tail, head, tail again. Three tosses. You can probably see this is not going to be a very interesting graph because with every single level, we have head, tail, head, tail, head, tail, head, tail. So I can probably get down to four levels, okay? You know, and then I'm out of space because you know, there's, I mean, there's probably a way to kind of fit, all, fit it all in, but it's just you know, doing a lot of <coughs> writing and drawing that really does not make any additional point to what I'm trying to explain here. Okay, but what is worthwhile to talk about is what is each node, what each leaf node is representing. So I'll take one particular random one. We'll just pick this one here. So with this one, it means you know in the sequence of tossing the coin, we first end with a we first have a T, so we have a tail followed by a head, which is over here, followed by another tail, which is over here, and then another head, which is the last uh, node of this entire branch. So this particular branch is representing, you know, the, uh-oh, uh, what did I do? Okay, so this is representing the specific um, coin toss your know, results of tet tail head tail head over here so that's how you can represent the outcome of tossing tossing a coin in this case four times but not five times you go five times would have 32 leaf nodes and you know it's just a little bit too tedious too tedious for me to handwrite you know <coughs> with a tablet uh oh I just dropped my stylus get it back there we go okay so good again and continuing with our discussion all right so uh, so you can also see how you know the event set is basically a subset of the of Omega <clears throat> the Omega in this case is consisting of tuples. Um, if I go back to the graph, let me just go back here. So this is not a set of tail, head, tail, head. This is a tuple. This is a four tuple of tail, head, tail, head because sequencing is important. Because we have another branch here. Let me look up one right here. This is head, tail, tail, head. It is a different branch, but it is distinct as another element of omega because it is a tuple of head tail tail head over here so this tells us that omega in this case is a set of five tuples in the problem that we are talking about here so each element may look like head 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 tail tail head tail head tail head and so on the e or the event set is you know basically all the ways or the tuples that we can end up with three heads out of five tosses because we are going back to the original problem in the description here. <coughs> so this way of looking at the outcome of each outcome, this way of looking at each outcome of the experiment is interesting, okay, because we are coding everything in just your head versus tail, which can also be converted into zeros and ones. But there's another way to do this. The other way to look at this is to look at the tuple of head, head, tail, tail, head as 0, 1, 4. So the conversion from this format to this format here is by encoding which position within the tuple are the heads or the you know, uh, results that we want. So we can see this is 
uh, trial zero, trial one, and this is trial four. So in this particular sequence, inside the in this particular outcome, zero, one, four, you know, are the destination of the trials that end up with the uh, outcome that we want. So we encode it as a set now of zero, one, four. You can see we're using set notation here and not using tuple notation over here. The reason why we're using set notation and not a tuple notation is if I reverse the order, like you know, if I list these three numbers uh, as four, one, zero, it would it would have meant exactly the same thing. It would still have meant that you know trial four, trial zero, and trial one are the ones that end up with the outcome that we want, which are the heads. So, but by shifting our perspective, by looking at you know a you know from a tuple notation to a set notation, we suddenly notice that this is a problem that we have seen already. Because if I were to ask you, how many ways can we arrange um, the head and the tails <coughs> such that we have three heads and two tails in a sequence of five, okay? And I'm asking you, how many ways can I arrange that? You would normally look at that and go like, hmm, I kind of need to complete that tree that we were looking at earlier, which is this one here. Um, make it complete, you know, give it a fifth level, and then we'll take a look at all the, um, we'll look at all the outcomes where, you know, there are exactly three heads and two tails, and then add up those, that will give us the total number of ways to end up with three heads and two tails after five coin tosses. That's one way to do it. However, if we start to encode the sequence using you know, this way, you know, in other words, you know, we are only paying attention to the trial numbers that end up with the, uh, the result or the outcome of a head, then it becomes a very familiar problem. Because how many trials do we have? We have exactly five trials, zero, one, two, three, and four, of which we want three of them to end up with the heads. So it becomes the same thing as choosing three out of five. And because we are looking at a set of 0, 1, 4 instead of a tuple of 0, 1, 4, that means you know, ordering is not important. So that means we are, we are counting the number of combinations and we're not counting the number of permutations. So as a result, five choose three becomes you know, the total number. It becomes the total number of ways that we can have five coin tosses and you know this number here five choose three is basically the number of ways that we can end up with three heads and two tails. So five choose three if you really want to figure out the exact value we can do go ahead and do that. <clears throat> I'm going back to my tablet here switch the screen to the tablet there we go. So five choose three, okay, so five choose three. The other way to write this is you know, C53, which is also the same as combin, if you use a spreadsheet, five three. But the way it is computed is you have five factorial divided by five minus three factorial. And then uh, also in the denominator, you also have a three factorial by itself. So five factorial is 120. Two factorial is just two. Three factorial is six. So that would be 10. There are 10 ways to arrange uh, three heads and two tails. Now, if you're not convinced, you can try to enumerate, right? You, know, you can try to list all 10 ways to do this. So one is head, 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 tail, tail, head, head, tail, head, tail, head, head, mm. <clears throat> tail, head, head. Oh, no, no, that won't work, would it? Um, okay, so I need another tail here. 
and then we have head head tail head head tail head tail head tail head okay head tail tail head head yep okay there we go so we have t uh, tail head 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 tail tail head head tail head tail head tail head head tail tail head 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 i think that should be all so one two three four five one two three four five so there are exactly 10 of those all right so i hope you know, this helps to convince you that you're know, shifting our way of encoding so let me give you the encoding in in the set also in this case it will be zero one two in this case it will be zero one three zero one four zero two three zero two four zero um three four this would be um one two and three this would be one two and four this would be one three and four and then the last one is going to be two three and four so there you go so we have the uh, the tuple representation on the left and then we have the set notation on the right hand side basically the set notation is really a set of the indexes where we find the heads so <clears throat> So you can see that you know everything is connected, right? You know you would think that coin tosses may not have anything to do with um, you know combinations and permutations, but it does. So when you look at everything and you you're asking about the probability, so in this case you know E is a set you know representing all the tuples that end up with three heads and two tails. The probability of that is over the um, size of omega or the outcome set omega. The outcome set omega has two to the power of five elements because you know we, in that case, the omega has no restrictions. It's basically you know asking if I have five coin toss tosses, what are the possible sequences of the heads and tails? So omega itself is going to include head, 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 head tail 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 and all of the other ones that we are not interested in the set e on the other hand consists of all the ones that we are interested in so we know the cardinality of e is 5 choose 3 because of what we just explained earlier that's 10 divided by 2 to the power of 5 which is 32 so we have 10 divided by 32 which is about one third so in order so the chances of getting three heads and two tails in the case of a coin that is not loaded, it's about one third. Okay, so that doesn't sound too bad, I hope. So now we move forward, and then we ask, hmm, that seems to have something to do with um, binomials, okay? So what I mean by that is, if you think about a coin that is not lo that is loaded now, okay? So if we look at a coin that is loaded, and P is the probability probability of landing on a head, and Q, which is one minus P, is the probability of landing on a tail, then the probability of an experiment of five trials can be seen as the following, which is P plus Q to the power of five. Now let's just take a look at this one here. Okay, it is P plus Q to the power of five because for every single coin toss, we can end up with a head, which corresponds to the P, or we can end up with a tail, which corresponds to the, to the Q. Raised to the power of 5, because each outcome is independent from the outcomes you know, that came earlier in the trial. So that's why it is you know, to the power of 5. 
Now there's also a graphical way of looking at this. So the graphical way of looking at this is once again going back to the graph notation, but I'm going to open a new slide here. It's look, it looks about the same as what we had before, but instead of labeling the actual outcome, I'm labeling the probability also. So we have a chance of P to land on a head. We have a chance of Q to land on the tail. And we'll, we'll do this only up to three levels because it, there's no real point in, do, in doing this any further. Okay, So we have another P over here, another Q over here, another P over here, another Q over here. And then finally, we have P, Q, P, Q, P, Q, and P, Q. All right, so in this particular case, not only do we know at, the, at each leaf node what type of um, head tail sequence are we getting, like you know, for instance, for this one, we end up with head, tail, tail. But we also know the probability of getting here because we can see from here it is P times Q times Q. Um, I'll give you another example. Let's take a look at this one here. This will be the sequence of tail, head, tail. But to get here, we have to go through, you know, one branch that has a Q probability, one chance, one uh, branch that has a P probability, and then the last one is a Q probability. So this is P times Q squared. This is um, P times Q squared as well, because in both of these, we end up with two tails and one head. So that is, this is, so this graph will now also accommodate um, a coin that is loaded, so that, you know, P is representing the chances of landing on the head, and Q is representing the chances of landing on the tail. Now, in the uh, module, um, I use an example of five tosses, <coughs> which is a little bit harder to um, to write out. But if you think about you know just you know, what you know about binomials, uh, p plus q you know to the power of five can be expressed as a sum where i goes from zero to five, <coughs> and then at the same time you know we have uh, p to the power of i times q to the power of 5 minus i. So when you look at the power of p versus the power of q, they have to add up to exactly 5. k of i is the coefficient of that particular term. So now the question is, how do we figure out all of these k of i's? Now just as an example okay, of what we are talking about here, let's take a look at your p plus q to the power of 2. That is p squared plus 2pq plus q squared. Okay? Oh, we cannot see it because I forgot to flip the screen. There we go. <coughs> so when you look at p plus q, the whole thing to the power of 3, then we have p squared plus 2pq plus q squared, which is the p plus q squared, the whole thing times p plus q again which then ends up with p cubed plus 2p squared q plus 2, oops, single one, plus uh, p q squared plus p squared q plus 2p q squared plus one single q cubed, and then we group items together, okay, we can see that it becomes p cubed plus 2p squared q, oh, three of those, sorry, plus three of um, p q squared plus q cubed, okay? So that means that the coefficient is one over here, 
the coefficient of this is 3, the coefficient is 3 over here, and the coefficient is 1 over here. But for each of these terms, you can see how this is 3, this is 3 plus 1, which is also 3, this is 1 plus 2, which is also 3, and this is also 3. So that means you know, when you add up these two, it's 3. When you add up these two, it's 3. This is also just 3 by itself. So when you combine the power between the P and the Q for each term in the summation, they always add up to 3. Now, the other, one, the other way to look at this is to say this actually contains a Q to the power of 0. Okay? The last one also contains a P to the power of 0 over here. We typically do not write those out, okay? But if you want to say, where's the other one? Well, here's the other one. We are just raising the other one to the power of zero because you know, there's none of those components. <coughs> All right. So uh, that's the little demonstration over there. So now we are getting into the actual you know, the theorems of you know that we need to understand. So now we have Pascal's identity as a, it's not exactly a theorem, okay, but it is, okay, I shouldn't say it's not a theorem. It is a theorem, um, but the way it's proven is fairly straightforward. So Pascal's identity starts with n choose k plus n choose k minus 1. And then uh, out of the definition, we expand k n choose k to be n factorial divided by k factorial times n minus k the whole thing factorial and you know n choose k minus 1 is the same way. So line 1 is just based on definition. Line 2 on the other hand is based on you know just algebra. Instead of writing n minus in parentheses k minus 1, I group things in slight in a slightly different way where we end up with n minus k grouped together and then the plus 1 on the outside is a plus one over here because we have the subtraction of a minus one, and that's why the uh, the one extra is uh, is actually an addition. <coughs> and then from line two to line three, uh, we also make the transition of changing. Uh, um, um, be, we we basically multiply both the numerator and the denominator by k. Now, the numerator is easy. If you multiply n factorial by k, it becomes n factorial times k. No, no big deal. The denominator is a little bit more interesting because when you multiply k to k minus 1, the whole thing factorial, you get k factorial. So this is one of those you know, weird things that you can do with factorial. Um, I call this the telescoping um, effect. I'm pretty sure there's a much more formal way to call that. So now we have this extra plus one over here, but we're gonna do the same trick. But this time we do the same trick by dividing both the numerator and the denominator by n minus k plus one. So the division by n minus k plus one of the numerator just shows up by itself like that. But when we divide n minus k plus one, the whole thing factorial by n minus k for the whole thing plus 1, then you get um, n minus k factorial because you just got rid of the highest term in n minus k the whole thing plus 1 factorial. So you, it becomes the next value, which is n minus k factorial. So once again, I made use of the telescoping ability of using uh, factorial. And once we have the, the two um, terms sharing the same denominator, then we can do all kinds of tricks here. So uh, on this side, you know, from here to here, I multiply the uh, both the numerator and the denominator by <coughs> n minus k plus one. So uh, I do this, you know, so that you know the the two numerators will now end up with the same denominator. Now these two denominators, the outer denominators are now the same, so they're combined, but the inner denominator are also now the same, so they can combine. So now I can basically look at the numerators of the numerators and add those up to, uh, together. So we have this thing as one component, 
this other thing as the second component and add up these two. And then what we do is we uh, integrate the n minus 1 plus 1, you know, as a denominator into the outer denominator. So the outer denominator becomes whatever it was before, but also multiplied by n minus k plus 1, because, you know, I combine this denominator into this denominator over here. And then on the top, I basically just use factoring uh, or distribution. So in this case, I, I use distribution so that we end up with n plus 1 factorial because you know, n factorial times n plus 1 is n factorial. So that's how the, the that's where the n plus 1 factorial is coming from. And then we have n factorial minus times minus k, which is over here. And then n factorial times k, which is over here. Those two cancel out. So now we end up with n plus 1, the whole thing factorial, divided by k factorial times n minus k plus 1 factorial. That is happening because n minus k and n minus k plus 1 are right next to each other. So when you look at n minus k factorial and you multiply that by n minus k plus 1, then you're just extending the factorial by 1. And that's, why we, that's how we ended up with n minus k plus 1, the whole thing factorial. And then I rewrite n minus k plus 1 so that I order that a little, in just a little bit differently. So the n plus 1 is grouped together. The minus k is on the outside. But this format is also the same as n plus 1 choose k. Because n plus 1 choose k is n plus 1 factorial by, divided by n plus 1 minus k factorial, which is this thing here, also divided by k factorial, and you know, which is also over here. So this is called you know, Pascal's identity. Um, so let me zoom out just one level so I can show the beginning and the end at the same time. <coughs> there we go. So this is known as you know, Pascal's identity, which basically says you know, n choose k plus n choose k minus 1 is really the same thing as n plus 1 choose k. So you look at something like this and you say, I'm not convinced, okay? And then you ask, so how do we know this is actually true? So what we do is we ask, okay, go, fine, you know, you're not convinced. So let's choose the smallest value we can choose for n and the smallest value we can choose for k. Now, k cannot be 0 because if k is 0, then k minus 1 is negative 1, and you cannot choose a negative number of items out of n. So k minus 1 itself has to be the smallest. It would be 0. And then um, n itself can be 0. All right, so let's see what happens when we have n being 0 and k being 1. Okay, I'm copying this onto my uh, tablet first, and then we'll continue the discussion on the tablet itself. Okay, so I'm ready to switch now, and there we go. All right, so we are saying that n is 0, k is 1. Um, well, probably not a good idea because you know, n should be greater than or equal to k. So we'll make n equal to 1. So now we have 1 choose 1 plus 1 choose 0. Okay. You can plug it into the actual equation and find out you know, what that is supposed to be. But that's basically just 2. Okay. It is really just 2 because 1 choose 1 is 1. And then 1 choose 0 is also 1. Now, does that make sense to you? In other words, I give you a bag with one item in it. And I give you an empty bag and say, in the first case, you know, I say, you know, how many ways can you choose one item out of one bag and put it into the other bag? There's exactly one way to do it, right? There's only one item in the bag, so there's only one possible outcome in that case. But for 1 choose 0, I'm giving you almost the same kind of situation. I give you a bag that has one single marble in it. And then I give you an empty bag and say, you know, choose nothing. Okay, Do not choose anything out of the bag that has one marble. 
to put it into the empty, you know, the new bag. So how many ways, how many possible outcomes do you have? One single possible outcome, okay? The new bag that I gave you remains empty. So that's only one single outcome. So that's why, you know, when you add up these two, it becomes two. Then we ask, what about the theorem itself? The theorem basically says that n choose k plus n choose k minus 1 is the same thing as n plus 1 choose k. So in this case, are we looking at this and say, is this the same thing as 2 choose 1? If I give you a bag with two marbles in it, and I ask you to choose one of those two and put it into the next bag, the, the new bag, the, an empty bag that they gave you initially, then yeah, there are exactly two possible outcomes because you could have chosen the first marble you, or you could have chosen the second marble. But since there's only one trial, that's all you get. So there are two possible outcomes in that case. <coughs> <coughs> so this is how you know uh, Pascal's identity works. But Pascal's identity is usually also visualized in a different way. Okay. So let me open a new slide over here. So I'm sure some of you have seen this. Okay, this is called Pascal's triangle. Okay. This is called Pascal's triangle, which does not seem to have anything to do with um, Pascal's identity. Well, it doesn't seem to have anything to do with Pascal's identity only because of the shape of it, okay? So we're gonna have to re-look at this in a, in a slightly different way, okay? So the way we look at this is what are the row numbers, right? You know, what, each, each, what is each row representing? And then, you know, what are the uh, quote-unquote columns representing? So <clears throat> the rows are corresponding to Ns, okay? So the N, so the first row is representing when n equals to um, 0. The second row is when n equals to 1. The third row is when n equals to 2. The third row, the fourth row is when n equals to 3 and so on. But what about the columns? So the columns is a little bit interesting here because you know, uh, they are slanted, at least in this representation. So the way we look at the column is like this. So this is the column indicating that k is 0. This is the column corresponding to k equals to 1, k equals to 2, and finally we have k equals to 3 over here. All right. So, and then each number is really n choose k. The question is, you know, do you see, oh, I do not want to hibernate. Okay. I must have pressed a key somewhere on the keyboard.
<clears throat> well, it looks like it's still recording, but my mouse is not responding. Hmm. Neither is my keyboard. So my external keyboard is not responding. All right, let me flip the screen a little bit here and see if I can use the built-in keyboard. So that part is still working. All right, just have to figure out. I think I know what just happened. Um, because I did not plug in my power supply correctly. Um, the computer ran out of a battery. And you know, when the battery is close to zero, it would automatically hibernate you know, in order to save itself. Um, all right, so let me switch back to this portion here. And the tablet screen is gone because you know it's it, it basically disconnected from the uh, from the tablet earlier, and my it still won't connect to my um, external keyboard. Ah, okay. So this sort of stuff you know just happens because my. Um, All right. Because I did not put in the um, the uh, USB C cable correctly, you know, sometimes it would charge right away, and sometimes it just refuses to charge. So let me see if I can still connect to the tablet. Yep. Okay, stuff still works. All right. So I can teach, continue teaching right here. I believe the recording is still ongoing. Let me double check that too. Because you know, I would hate to lose content because of this. Um, so I'm looking at the recording for today. And this is going to be the second one. All right. Yep, it's still recording because I can see how the uh, file size is still increasing. So we are still good over here. I just have to switch from my um, external keyboard to the internal keyboard. It's no biggie. Okay. All right, so let me move the screen back up here. Okay, that's good. We are still in business. Now that the computer is charging itself again, it's all good. All right, so I have to move things around a little bit on my desk, you know, just because you know, the external keyboard is not working. All right, so this is how we can look at um, Pascal's identity. So the way we look at this is, you know, what about when n equals 4? So when n equals to 4, we extend all the columns down a little bit here, okay, and we start a new column over here. So we still have a one here. So this value here is, um, this value here is basically four choose one. But then we can use four choose one, okay? It's not supposed to be a zero, okay? I put a, you know, I put a circle there, but it looks like a circle, a, a, a zero. I should probably use a highlighter to indicate, you know, I'm looking at this position here. There we go. So four choose one is um, going to be the same thing as the previous two items added. So that would be the same thing as uh, three choose one plus three choose zero. 
So that would be corresponding to three choose one is this particular value here. And then three choose zero is this value over here. So when I add up these two, it is a four that I need to put here. So the next location, which is this location here, is asking what is four choose two. So I'm going to use the, the previous two items again. So one of those two is a uh, three choose one, and then the other one is three choose two. So let me use the circle here. Uh, we have already pointed out the three choose one. This is the three choose two. So uh, three plus three is a six. So we put a six over here. So likewise, this is going to be a four, and this one is going to be a one over here. So I hope this kind of helps to show you, you know, how the Pascal's triangle is really a, a more graphical representation of Pascal's identity. <coughs> All right, so let me switch back to the module over here. All right, so that's Pascal's identity. But Pascal's identity is not exactly just what we want because what we really want is to prove the binomial theorem. The binomial theorem is interesting from a few perspectives. The first one is, what is it really trying to say? It's basically saying for every natural number lowercase n, p plus q to the power of n can be expressed as a sum where i goes from 0 to n, and then each term that we're adding in this sigma or sum notation is n choose i times p to the power of i times q to the power of n minus i. In other words, based on what we have talked about a little bit earlier, these coefficients, the k of i, is actually corresponding to n choose i. Okay, so now we are relating um, binomial um, formulae or binomial expressions to the concept of you know choosing or counting in this particular case. So the way this is proven is uh, proof by induction. So in addition to proof by contradiction, proof by induction is the other technique of proof that is super useful in computer science, um, especially when you're dealing with uh, discrete math where things are you know there. Um, there's a natural, you know, there's, a na there, there's a nature of stepping in the nature of you know, the, um, the mathematics and also the algorithms. So to prove a theorem using uh, proof by induction, the first thing we do is we establish a base case. The base case is, you know, if we need to show a theorem, meaning this part here, is true for all natural number n, then we choose a specific natural number and say, oh, this theorem is definitely true when n is that specific value. That's what the base case is. Now for natural numbers, we have a natural end to the entire thing because you know, even though one, on one side you know, we, we can keep going, on the other side we are definitely the smallest natural number is just zero. We cannot do that with uh, with integers because with integers you know, it expands you know on both sides, but with natural numbers, it, it has a natural starting point when <coughs> <coughs> it has a natural starting point of zero. So in order to prove this theorem is true when n equals to zero, that's pretty easy, right? Because p plus q to the power of zero is going to be a one, and um, how do I rewrite 1? Well, 1 can be written as p to the power of 0 times q to the power of 0. Yeah, I mean, what is so special about it? Well, I can also you know, add on another 1 over here because 0 choose 0 is by definition 1. So this entire thing is just 1 itself. And then I add the summation notation here where I just go from 0 to 0 and I do, instead of using um, this i here, this being a zero here, I just turn it into an i, 
and the zero is the n, right? You know, so if n equals to zero, this part here becomes this part over here when n equals to zero. So this is the conclusion of the in this is the conclusion of the uh, the proof of the base of the uh, proof by induction proof. The next step is an interesting one because in proof by induction, the next step is to make an assumption that the theorem is true for some arbitrary n equals to k. Now, don't ask me what k is supposed to be, okay? You know, this is an assumption that we can at least find one k where the theorem is true when n equals to k. So now we have to prove the theorem is also true for the case of n equals to k plus 1. Now this step is really important. It cannot be k plus 2, it cannot be k plus 3, but it has to be k plus 1. It has to be the right, it has to be the next available value for n. So in this case, we use the, um, this is the um, assumption, okay, because you know, this is the induction assumption. So we assume that you know, the theorem is true when n equals to k already, which means this equality has to hold, because this equality right here is based on the theorem when n equals to k. So p plus q to the power of k is you know, the sigma from, uh, of i going from 0 to k, and then k choose i times p of i times q of k minus i. That's based on the um, assumption that the theorem is true when, e when n equals to k. So now we have to prove the equality um, for p plus q to the power of k plus 1 to be the same thing as, well, basically, we are trying to prove that the theorem is true when n equals to k plus 1 over here, k plus 1 over here, k plus 1 over here. So the way we usually do it is to uh, start with the um, case when n equals to k plus 1, and then we immediately make use of the um, uh, induction step assumption, which is to basically say, oh, let's break this up, okay? p plus q to the power of k plus 1 is the same thing as p plus q times p plus q to the power of k. Now that we have p plus q to the power of k, we make use of the assumption, okay, the assumption that uh, the theorem is true when n equals to k. So we take p plus q to the power of k and turn it into its sigma notation. And then we use, um, um, basically this is just, uh, <coughs> uh, this, is just your, this is just your usual, um, Distribution, okay, we can distribute uh, multiplication to a sum so that each term in the sum is multiplied by the same amount, okay, so this is actually just distribution in algebra. And then after that, we break it up into two sigma notations, so we have you know, one side you know, being multiplied by the extra p, okay, so this p is combined with p to the power of i, so all the terms now have p to the power of i plus 1, and then the other one has q to the power of k minus i plus 1 because it is taking this q out of the p plus q. And then we uh, break it up even further, okay? So we basically separated um, I'm, I'm taking a second look here just to make sure you know, how I broke up all those terms. So we take a look at this particular term and we broke off the case when i equals to 0, okay, so when i equals to 0, <coughs> <coughs> we break it out to here, okay? Now, there are a few things that are, that do not make sense, okay, or at least does not seem to make sense. When i equals to 0, p of i is p of 0, okay, that, that's fine. Um, when i is 0, k minus i is k minus 0, plus 1 is just your k plus 1. <coughs> <coughs> and we end up with q to the power of k plus 1 over here. So p, the, the, the term with, with p to the power of 0 is over here, that's fine. The term with q to the power of k minus i plus 1 
it becomes k plus 1 over here. That makes sense too. What does not seem to make sense is k choose 0 is now becoming k plus 1 choose 0. That does not seem to make sense. But it does because anything choose 0 is 1. Okay, It doesn't matter how many items or how many marbles are in the original bag. If I tell you to take nothing out of the old bag to put into the new bag, what is the only one, what is the number of outcomes for that experiment? There's only one possible outcome, right? You know, because your new bag is just empty, there's nothing in it. So that means you know, it doesn't matter what the, how many things you're choosing from, as long as you're choosing nothing out of that many things, it's always going to be one. So that's why that allowed me to change your k choose i, which is k choose 0, to k plus 1 choose 0. So I'm taking one term out of this sigma here, so I have to remember that i equals to 0 is already handled all the way over here, so now i starts with 1 over here. I do something like that with this particular term here, except instead of you know, taking the first term when i equals to 0, I take the last term in this case when i equals to k and separate it out into its own term. So when i equals to k, we have k choose k, um, p to the power of k plus 1, q to the power of 0. And you can see how you know, k to the, p to the power of k plus 1 is over here, because remember, i is k you know, when I took out that term. And then we have q to the power of 0, because when, k, when i and q are the same, then q to the power of k minus i is q to the power of 0. So this is k choose k, but I turn it into k plus 1 choose k plus 1. But that's fine too, because that's just 1. k choose k is 1, k plus 1 choose k plus 1 is also just 1. Now, there are two ways to look at this. One is you can plug it into the number of combinations and convince yourself that the math works out the way it's supposed to work out. The second way is to look at, look at this from the perspective of I give you a bag of many marbles, let's say k marbles, right? And I ask you, if I were to give you a new bag, okay, and I ask you to choose your k marbles out of the original bag, how many possible outcomes do we get? There's only one possible outcome. Every marble got transferred from the old bag to the new bag. But that's only one single outcome because ordering is not important when we look at the number of combinations. So the last term of this sigma becomes its own independent term over here, but I also have to make sure that the original sigma notation will now have, it's going to end with i equal to k minus 1 because the case of i equals to k is already handled all the way over here. And then from this line to this line, I did some <coughs> uh, manipulation using uh, on this side. So instead of saying I want to start from 0, ending up with k minus 1, you know, when I'm looking at i, I go like, well, why don't I start with i equals to 1 and ending with k, but everywhere I refer to i inside the original expression, I refer to i minus 1 now. So uh, this i becomes the i minus 1, this i plus 1 becomes i minus 1 plus 1, which is just i. This i, k minus i becomes k minus in parentheses i minus 1, which then you know, becomes you know, just k minus i, the whole thing, plus 1. In other words, what I'm doing from this step to this step here is by changing the way I utilize the index variable by subtracting one from the index variable everywhere I see the index variable, I can now change the range of the index and up it by one so that instead of going from zero to k minus one, I can now go from one to k. <coughs> but that allowed me to combine these two sigma notations because these two, these two sigma notations now have the same range for the index variable i. So now I can just take whatever is in the in inside each sigma notation and add them up, you know, individual, add them up, add them up inside the sigma notation. We can see how the p to the power of i, q to the power of k minus i plus one 
is the same between these two sigma notation. So by using factoring, it becomes your one single factor, you know, because this part is common. The part that is not common is one has k choose i minus one, the other one has k choose i. So that is still kind of different. So by factoring, I combine the common element, but I also have the non-common element having its own sum over here. This is where the Pas this is where Pascal's identity comes in. Pascal's identity comes in handy because k choose i minus one plus k choose i is really the same thing as k plus one. The whole thing choose i. <coughs> So that's how I can combine these two um, uh, combinatoric you know, um, expressions into one single one. And then once I have this combined, I also notice that this is k plus 1 choose 0. This is k plus 1 choose i, where i goes from 1 to k. This is k plus 1 choose k plus 1. So now I wrote all three terms into one single sigma notation. I extend the sigma notation, I extend the range of the index variable from 0 down to, uh, from 1 down to 0 on one end, and then go from k to k plus 1 on the other end, so that now the, the sigma notation is having i to range from 0 to k plus 1. But I'm also making sure that you know, by doing so, this is handling the case when i equals to 0, okay? This is handling the case when i equals to k plus 1, and you know, also making you know, sure that the power of q is handled the same way. So now I have you know, the conclusion of, okay, this is a rather long derivation, but in the end, we end up with the conclusion of p plus q to the power of k plus 1 boils down to the sigma notation of i equals to 0 to k plus 1, and then each term we're adding in the sigma notation is in the format of k plus 1 choose i times p to the power of i plus q to the power of k plus 1 minus i. <coughs> but that, in return, matches the format of the binomial theorem. So by this time, we have shown that by assuming the binomial theorem is true when n equals to k, we have now shown that then it also has to be true that when n equals to k plus 1, the binomial theorem also has to be true. So now we arrive to the actual proof of the binomial theorem. Now, we are already close to the end of this module over here. So the, the question is, what is the significance of the binomial theorem? Well, the significance of the binomial theorem is um, it makes it easy to figure out um, in a coin toss you know, situation, situation, what is the probability of you know um, x many heads you know, out of x many tosses? Okay, because you know in that case we just have to look at one single term if that is what you're interested in. So let's say we are looking at five tosses, so n equals to five, and we are looking at p as the probability of ending with a head, and we want m of those this number is giving you the probability of having exactly that configuration. Um, and that pretty much you know, concludes the entire um, section over here. Um, we don't really take too, well, I mean, you know, it's important to look at the observed you know, empirical probabilities and so on. Uh, so we'll talk about that, you know, separately. But, you know, getting back to just you know, the binomial distribution, why is it you know, so important? I mean, what are the chances that you're going to write a game that involves you know, you know, coin tosses using a loaded coin and blah, blah, blah? Well, the chances is not really that great. Okay? You know, you're unlikely to be writing uh, such a program. However, in um, computer science, a lot of stuff is between true or false, or 0 or 1, or erroneous versus not erroneous. <clears throat> so the, in the analysis of, for instance, okay, um, what are the chances that I can have a packet transmitted incorrectly, okay, or I have a packet or you know network packet format that has self-correction ability for up to 
four bits, okay? So I can be transmitting four bits incorrectly within the packet, and the packet contains redundant information to not only figure out that you know these four bits are transmitted incorrectly, but to figure out how to how to fix it. So in other words, I can have up to four um, you know, mistransmitted you know, bits, and I don't have to retransmit. So the chance I might be interested in the chances of you know what if I what are the chances that I have more than four erroneous bits? Because in those situations, I cannot I, I will have to be forced to retransmit, and that's going to cost extra time. So all of those types of analysis you know, tie in with the binomial distribution. Um, and there are a lot of really interesting real life situations that are also related to the binomial distribution. Um, let me take a look at the time. Um, so we are almost done with discrete probability, but I do want to show you um, um, a few things about the you know, probabilities. Okay, so there are there are two distinct ways of computing probabilities that we have talked about. One way is to use the binomial binomial <coughs> distribution, and then the other way is to use the cardinality of e divided by the cardinality of omega. So these are the two main ways of co computing uh, probability. So the question is, when do I use which one? Okay, that becomes the, the question. So the way you look at this is to look at how the experiment is set up. So you have to look at how the experiment is set up. And let me, okay, let me just put a bar over here. So when you look at an when you're looking at an experiment, and you basically look at the outcome of each trial. So if trial zero is the same thing as trial one, it's the same thing as trial two, blah blah blah, and so on, and then the cardinality of t zero is two, then you have a pretty good chance that you're dealing with a binomial distribution. Because in a binomial distribution, every single time you have a trial, it must have exactly the same two outcomes. It's just that the probability of each outcome is not exactly 0.5. It can be, you know, it can be very lopsided. That gives you the idea of, okay, I might be using your know, binomial distribution. But for everything else, okay, you're more likely that you're using this method of calculating uh, the probability. Which means you are going to you're going to have to figure out um, how an experiment is set up. So there are uh, several attributes that need to be determined in this case. Um, the first one is uh, with or without replacement. In other words, does each trial take away a um, possible outcome from all the future your know, trials? And if the answer is without replacement, okay, then you have to ask, are we looking at, is ordering important? Because if ordering is important, okay, then you're looking at permutations. If not, you're looking at combinations. Now, on the other hand, if it is with replacement, then you're looking at, you know, just um, the cardinality of a trial, because they're all the same, raised to the power of the number of trials. That becomes, you know, the, um, <coughs> that becomes the, uh, the total number of, uh, of outcomes. And then, you know, you have then to have to take a look at E, which is uh, the event set. So the event set is a little bit different um, because you have to look at the event set from the perspective of, you know, okay, so if we're only interested in certain cases, like in Lotto, where you might be interested only in matching three out of the five winning numbers, but not the other two, right? Or you can also combine, with, combine that with whether the Powerball number is matching or not. Oh, that reminds me. I am in the process of making a new homework assignment uh, for the lotto tickets. 
but I have to be careful in terms of you know how to set it up so that you know um, I can specify the actual you know um, winning the winning numbers and also the Powerball number. But then I also have to specify what kind of prize you know I'm looking for. So I'm still working on it, okay? But I will be done probably by Monday. So by Monday, you would also have a new homework assignment, which is a programming homework assignment based on the lotto game. And the assignment is going to um, ask you to write code to give me all the tickets, okay? That will give me a specific uh, prize value um, based on you know, the winning numbers and also the, the Powerball number. So that's going to be coming on Monday because I'm still working on the format because I want to be able to grade this automatically um, but you know because otherwise I'll be the person counting all the lines and double checking everything. I don't want to be doing that. I want my program to be doing that but I also want it to be in a format that the program can easily parse so I'm still working on that particular part. But anyway, getting back to this discussion here. So E is, there's no set equation or set formula to uh, compute the cardinality of E because it really depends on, you know, what type of a problem we are dealing with. So that means, you know, when we look at problems on this side, you probably have to take a look at, does it fit into the lotto problems you know, uh, that we have talked about? Does it fit into the birthday problem that we have talked about? So these are the two examples of problems that we have solved on th this side of the equation. And then for the binomial distribution, that's basically coin tosses. So there are these two rather distinct category of problems that we can be asked to solve you know, when it comes to discrete probabilities. All right, so with that said, okay, <clears throat> getting back to um, Canvas, what we have left to do after discrete probability, we're gonna have exam two. <laughs> oh, goodness, I have to, yeah, right after I finish you know, the grading of exam one, here comes exam two. All right, so after that, we're gonna talk about the, um, the big O, which is big Omicron, big Omega, and also big Theta notation. So that, that's actually a, pr a pretty important concept, you know, that we have to go over. And then after that, we'll talk about graphs. And if we have time left, you know, we can talk about predicate calculus. Um, predicate calculus is kind of interesting, okay? I would say predicate calculus is a little bit more interesting compared to uh, even the graphs. But on the other hand, you know, graphs is much more integral to the other things that we have talked about, the set notation and all that stuff. Predicate calculus opens up, you know, basically a whole new category of topics, um, which is still related to what we have talked about so far, but not as much as, you know, an algorithm that makes use of, you know, the set notation and uh, tuples and stuff like that, which is, you know, graphs. So I would say graphs is a better way to kind of wrap up the entire semester.